Very good evening to one and all, and a warm welcome to the next session of the Extramural Lecture Series. I am Emil Biju, and it is my pleasure to be your host for this evening. Extramural Lectures is a platform for students of IIT Madras to interact with distinguished personalities from across the globe from diverse fields. We envision to serve as a platform to promote knowledge in a multitude of domains, probe the community of the country's top intellectuals to think outside their strict realm of pursuit, and to create a free atmosphere of open-ended exchange of intellectual thoughts. To this end, we are driven to host eminent personalities, as well as individuals who have shown great initiative towards driving forward change. Therefore, our distinguished guest for today is renowned political strategist, Mr. Prashant Kishore. Celebrated as one of the most eminent and sought after political strategists in India, Mr. Kishore's wealth of experience in the realm of Indian electoral politics stands unparalleled. Sir, it's our privilege to have you here with us today. May I request Professor Preeti Agalyam to welcome the chief guest on our behalf. Thank you, ma'am. It is our pleasure to also welcome Professor Sudarshan Patmanabhan, who would be moderating this session with us. Professor Sudarshan Patmanabhan is the advisor to the Student Legislative Council of IIT Madras and a professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. We are sure that his depth of experience would help us derive deep insights from this talk. May I now invite you, sir, to introduce our guest to us and take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, folks. Uh, nice crowd and uh, welcome all. And welcome to Mr. Prashant Kishore. I'll just read a prepared statement. Um, after five or 10 minutes of uh, interaction, and then I'll open up the session to all of you. Uh, Mr. Prashant Kishore is going to talk about the theme today, youth, technology, and politics. Uh, Sir Kishore is from Bihar, and he is, a, he is trained as a public health professional, has worked for the UN for almost eight years, and uh, his major success as a political strategist are uh, many, I will name a few here. In 2012, uh, Gujarat campaign, BJP, is, uh, Mr. Modi as the Chief Minister of Gujarat. 2014, uh, for BJP, India's first social media campaign that completely revolutionized Indian politics. And uh, 2015, uh, Bihar, and he also started IPAC, which is actually uh, Indian Political Action Committee. And uh, obviously, you know that uh, Nitish Kumar ji won the elections. And, and in his recent avatar as uh, JDU vice president, hope he'll be able to actually put many of his strategies into practice. And uh, he also started. CAG, which is Citizens for Accountable Governance. And, uh, and in 2014 elections, his Chai Pe Charcha was actually a mega hit. And you know the uh, impact it had on the elections as a whole and also um, in other campaigns as well. Um, and Punjab elections 2017, Captain Amarinder Singh, the Chief Minister of Punjab, has been on record about the role of PK, so within, uh, within courts. So Captain Amarinder Singh calls him PK, Prashant Kishore. So um, without further ado, I would actually, I have a few questions that I would like to ask. And then after five or 10 minutes, I will open it up for you to ask questions. And I think we already have collected questions in the Google uh, form. So we'll be able to actually read out from the days. And uh, if he wants to answer questions directly later, we will be able to open it up as well. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you. It's a great privilege, uh, privilege on my part to be amongst you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, before you start the questions, uh, I just want to uh, say a couple of things. Maybe I'll take a few minutes. My, this whole idea of uh, someone being a political strategist 
political aid is overhyped, overrated. No single individual, no matter who he is, no single individual or entity can impact the outcome of elections. Never make that mistake. This is how media reports it. Or this is how you probably, some of you look at it. But this is highly overrated. Never get into that trap. People on the margin might make some contribution here and there. My area of interest as of now is bringing more youth in politics because I genuinely believe to bring change in India, if we want to bring fundamental change, three things has to be there. We need to bring more youth in politics not only to do the backstage management or bring crowd or do jail bharo andolan kind, but actually youth who have the opportunity to become part of the electoral politics. The second thing I believe that we need to decentralize as a country. We need to respect what was uh, uh, brought in our constitution in 90s, which is empowering Panchayati Raj, a country of our size and a scale, no matter how good or bad the government is, cannot be run by a few individuals sitting in Chennai or Delhi or whatever. As per the constitutional mandate, 50% of the developmental budget should be spent through the local bodies. Almost 25 years since the amendment has been brought in the constitution, we have not reached even 20%. And the third thing which I am very passionate about is allowing lateral entry at a scale in government. Uh, something uh, on which I had a difference of opinion with Mr. Modi after he became Prime Minister, one of the reasons I would have left. And uh, so on these three points, I would love to take any questions, but these are the three things which I am passionate about. This is what I do. What I am doing as of now on all these three. I'll take one minute on, as far as youth in politics is concerned, I have made a commitment now that next two, three years of my life, I'm going to dedicate it fully to bring one lakh, 100,000 youth in politics, those who otherwise do not have a uh, political uh, background. And out of those one lakh people, at least 15,000, 12 to 15,000 people are going to fight elections in Bihar. Because I have a political platform in Bihar, I cannot commit anywhere else. But this is something which anyone who is listening to me or uh, following me or uh, even from a distance uh, have interest in what I do should hold me accountable to that if I am able to deliver this commitment in next couple of years, I should get one lakh plus people in the political establishment I am part of and make 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 of them fight elections at different levels. The second thing is the decentralization. In Bihar, uh, I'm committed to make the local body election fight on the party uh, symbol because that is where the leadership should uh, get trained and emerge from. Uh, so next elections which you'll see in Bihar, uh, the local bodies elections, which elects close to two lakh people every, every round, you will see that will be fought on party symbol. And third, on the lateral entry, uh, what I wanted to create in India was the Bharat Bikas mission that would have allowed uh, at least, if not more, 20,000 people to literally come seamlessly in the government, work in the area of their choice, come and go back. An idea which uh, me and Mr. Modi shared and developed almost two years, because a lot of you might not know, I've been working with him since 2011, and not as a political strategist. I left UN and came to work on malnutrition with him. And this is one idea on which we were invested. For whatever reason, it did not work out. In Bihar, when we won, the first thing I got Nitish Kumar to agree is to set up this Bihar Bikas mission, uh, where lateral entries, it's a setup where lateral entries are allowed, not 
in the manner and the scale which I would have wanted again because you have to re realize understand one thing these setups there is so much of resistance to lateral entry you might have seen an ad by government of India where they have asked for 10 posts that they wanted to fill through lateral entry and there was so much of halagula about it because bureaucracy that runs the government uh, has been running the government for decades no one would like a young person from IIT who has done a research in water resource to come and uh, start advising the water resource secretary. That guy might be running, I was just joking with some of your colleagues, the guy was running a health department or transport department, today he becomes the water uh, secretary and he is supposed to be knowing everything. You as a young researcher might have gone to the best school, you might be knowing the best practices in water resource, but you have no opportunity to go and contribute in how the Chennai's water problem could be solved. The commissioner here who sits here and probably knows not even W of water has come to the department only five days back. Before that, he might be running any department. He is the master of everything. So this will happen. And uh, sooner or later, whoever takes my help has to commit. This is the fees I demand, that you have to create a lateral entry system. Ideally, I thought, as all young people think, I'm no longer as young as I claim to be. I'm 41, but in India, if you're in politics, you're never old. <laughs> Everyone is a Yuvaneta. But I think uh, in next uh, few years, if I would be lucky and if I'm able to uh, win a few more elections, you'll see this lateral entry at least starting at the state level. Couple of things which you do not pay attention to. Why so important to get youth in politics? Everyone talks about Iwa. But do you know, in 1952, the first Lok Sabha which we had, 26% MPs were below 40 years. 26% MPs in first Lok Sabha were below, uh, were 26, uh, below 40 years. Today, what is the number? 7%. Only 7% MPs today are less than 40. Now you need to know something more about it. Those who are below 40 and are MPs, 67% of them, I'm talking about all parties included, belong, are belonging to some political family or the other. No one is allowed to enter. If you are below 40, 67% MPs in this present Lok Sabha belong to some political family. I give one more layer of information. Below 40, if you are a Congress MP, 100% of them are political dynasties. 100%. I encourage you to go and check the data. Net data is free. You are all computer savvy guys. Look at this figure. The bulk of member parliament in the first Lok Sabha, their age group was 40 to 55. 54% of MPs in our first Lok Sabha were in the age group of 41 to 55. If you add these two groups, two-thirds of MPs were below 55 in the first Lok Sabha. Today, the maximum number of MPs, 46% to be precise, are in the age group of 55 to 70. And 13% of them are more than 71 year. A phenomena which first three Lok Sabha was never there. If you look at the first three Lok Sabha, not only 52, 52, 57, 62. In three Lok Sabha, we never had MPs who were 70 and above, maybe one or two here and there. It started only from 1967 onwards. Now such is the case that close to 15% MPs are above 670. Why? Because entry for the younger people who do not have money, who do not have political background is becoming difficult. You are also getting less enthusiastic about politics. 
I, a quote which I always share with my colleagues, I must say with you. Plato has said that if you do not participate in democracy, be ready to be ruled by your inferiors. So you might be feeling good about being in IIT, being a scientist, engineer, whoever you are, or whatever you want to become. But if you keep cribbing about the politicians and the politics, be ready that someone will rule you who will be much inferior to what you are. So you do not participate in democracy at your own cost. So please, sitting in the room and cribbing about politicians is not good enough. If that has to ever change, it has to be changed by people of India. It, people will not come from outside India to change the politics. That does not mean that you leave your studies. That does not mean that you do not prepare for your civil, servant, civil services or engineering, whatever you want to do. But keep in mind that when life gives you a chance, do try. Even if you do not want to become active politicians, be informed, be engaged. For that, you do not necessarily mean to uh, need to join a political party. But there is nothing that prevents you to spend some time knowing and engaging on the issues that actually concerns your own life and the gen generations to come. With this, I close and I'm happy to hear the questions, whatever professor has here or you guys. Thank you. So actually, before uh, we came here, several students and uh, Mr. Kishore had a very interesting discussion about various issues. And um, you would like to touch upon a few of those issues to set the stage, set the ball rolling. And after that, it will be a very short discussion, okay? Then we'll open up to the students. Uh, in real politics, winning is everything. Does policy or governance play a major role in political campaigns? Or are there just tactics and strategy to win elections? So winning is important in every sphere of life, not only in politics. Make no mistake. How much is the importance of governance or the delivery? In real terms, it's not that much. So a lot of time you hear that actually governance does not fetch you vote. But what it does fetch is the credibility. If I have to simplify what works to the best of my understanding, not that I know a lot, you need to get the combination of three things right if you have to win elections. One is the messenger, which is the leader. You need to be enthused by the person. You have to have a trust on that guy. If Prashant Kishore says that I will change India, no one is interested because I don't have that credibility or trust among the people. So delivery or governance comes in building that trust. Or your own character allows people to have that trust in you. If someone has delivered as CM or as a uh, member parliament or as an MLA, when he says that I will do X, Y, Z, there is a greater degree of trust. But per se, if you have built road, you have built hospital, that will not fetch you vote directly. But it gets into the brand or gets into the making of the messenger or the leader. The second thing which is important is the guy should say the right thing. The message and the messenger should be having the right message. If people are concerned about unemployment and you're talking about uh, something else, of course, there'll be no connect. And the third thing what you hear about campaign and the various method is the format in which he engages. It should be interesting enough for people to be attracted, whether it's a rally or a chakha charcha or a social media or hologram, whatever you see, that's a format. So you have to get the combination, the messenger, the leader, the message, the pe people's concern, the issues that concerns people. And if message is delivered by a credible messenger in a format that is engaging, you are more likely to win, win than lose. So whatever you have delivered as part of government contributes in you as a messenger. And also probably if you have worked hard, you also know to get the mess right message across. Many people get this wrong. I would say most of us, we get it wrong. You'd be surprised to know there are a lot of people from uh, Andhra here, I was told. 
In Andhra, if I ask you, what is the most talked about issue? 99% people will say job, mangai, corruption, etc., etc. When we actually looked the data closely, it's a drainage. The thing which most households have mentioned as the thing they want their governments to do is drainage. Now, imagine you go back to the hostel and one day or go back to your flat and imagine what happens if drainage is clogged in your flat. What kind of mess your life will become? You and I do not realize this. We just can't realize this. In Bihar, we found close to one third of FIRs or the local level disputes were arising out of drainage problem. You tell me a single survey where you would find this. You will not be able to find it. So in Bihar, Mr. Modi announced 1.5 lakh crore package. To counter that, we said seven nitish ke saath nishche. First thing was making pakka, pakki karan of the nali. That is the drainage. So if you get it right, people are not looking for 1.5 lakh crore maybe 60% or 50% people do not even know what the number looks like. One, ek so, pachas, lakh, crore, rupiah, kitna hota hai, logo ko pata hi hai. But if you come and tell that, you know, if I am the chief minister tomorrow, aapki nali ban jayegi, iska pakki karan kar diya jayega. People understand that. So it is very easy for you to say, message ko to sabko pata hi hai, bhai, mahangai se sab trust hai, brashta char se sab, I am not talking about that, but to get the message right, is the most important thing other than having that leader. And what is Format that? is the list of between these three. What bothers you so much, social media, data, chai charchar. This the, among these three that's the that comes at the at the lowest. So um, you have had a lot of international experience in UN, especially working on policy. How does that experience help you in um, elevating the quality of discourse or informing the politics, policy, uh, discourse in our country? I don't know. International experience has helped me any bit on that. But whatever I used to do in UN, I came to work on malnutrition in India. I did not come as a political strategist in my family. Like all of yours family, if you mention politics, people will say, Tum pagal ho ho kya? Have you gone mad? You are a UN diplomat, why would you leave that and become, try to become an advisor or a support to any politician? But what worked is, say for example, in UN I used to write speeches for my office heads. There is so much into, that goes into writing the speeches of UN biggies. When I came to Mr. Modi, I remember after four months, First time I was brought into, because he was coming to a famous uh, paper in your state, Tughlaq. So he was to deliver his speech in English. So he would have said, okay, yeah, I have Prasanji, inko bhi, madab jo unki char paant logon ki team thi, call him also. So that was my first thing. And I would have also written something which he would deliver here as a speech. And then they realized that, okay, it is good. Then one step done. Then we launched him on Facebook. Then one more step. It's not like one day you come and you, someone has appointed you as his advisor and then you, what you read in the paper. It's not like that. It has been every day a struggle. When you put all that four or five years of work in one bucket and then name it as a political strategy or whatever, it looks big. For us, it has been a daily survival that I go, get up in the morning and I have to better someone who was already there doing whatever he or she was doing. No leader or no political establishment, there is nothing called clean slate. It's not that Mr. Modi would not have someone as a speech writer. But if I come and I deliver and make him realize that, okay, I can write his speeches slightly better, then you get one step further. If you can analyze data better than what his team was doing, then you also get into data. If you launch him in Facebook, then he realizes, oh, this is a good platform to be on. Then you get one more inch. When it comes to international, I was doing lot, I, I was heading social policy and uh, planning and monitoring in UN, in West Central Africa. 
So I used to joke uh, that all the questionnaires which we used to do, why do you humanize, why, why do you breastfeed or why you don't, why do you feed a child one way or other, the questions remains, uh, questions changed, the techniques were the same. Now we started asking why do you vote, what takes you to a polling booth, what you like in a, uh, in a leader or what you don't like in a leader. The questions changed but the knowledge of his statistics is the same. And because we have done or we were doing a lot of uh, surveys and using data when I was in UN, probably that would have helped because uh, in his team at that time probably were not that many people who would have very good understanding of data or statistics or uh, large spreadsheets and how, how that could be put to use for the political decision making. So, but international exposure per se doesn't help. So coming to the next question, it's about big data and AI. What do you think? I told someone who practices AI, uh, if you ever want to make use of AI or data, first be the person to realize that this is not as effective as you claim to be. AI or data cannot make any change on the electoral outcome. That is very far-fetched. Even it cannot change the way you think, the way you re react or respond. What it could do is to help understand how people think, what they are doing. It is bringing a structure to gathering a lot of information. As I was telling in that meeting, Mahatma Gandhi would not have AI, but still he would know that salt is an issue which bothers probably large uh, section of the masses. Today probably someone would analyze, put AI and say, okay, drainage is an issue on which people are excited. But if you as a practitioner of AI starts thinking that just because you are able to know what the drainage is a major issue, you can change the electoral outcome of the game, that would be a little far-fetched. So be humble about it. These are just the tools, very small in the very big puzzle, whether AI or data, it definitely helps. More so because our country is so big. Everything runs into millions. A district is like 2 million, 2.5 million. So if you are good at spreadsheets, it's always help. Even if it is simply sorting the name, number, uh, surnames, people, uh, different attributes, their behavioral traits, it always helps. So in that way, this could be put to use and is being put to use, but never think that this is something that could make an impact on the electoral, electoral outcome. It could help organize part of the political or the campaign decision making, but nothing beyond it. What you read about Cambridge Analytica and all, it's all bunkum. Cambridge Analytica has never worked with any political party in India, no matter what people are telling. Everyone now is telling that no, they, they have worked with the other party because they want that there is a vote in it. It's overstating of your CV, which you and I do. All of us, we do. You have worked in, as a volunteer in Obama campaign, you come back and you will write that I ran the Obama campaign. <laughs> you must have met hundreds of people who claim that they were part of Obama campaign. If I ask you, very few would be able to say who actually ran the Obama campaign, I don't know. I have met at least 10 people who claim that I have run Obama campaign. So has the Modi campaign, so has the Trump campaign. Success has many fathers. So don't get into that part. Cambridge Analytica that they have taken, you know, the, one of the claim I tell you and you'll realize, one of the claim on which the famous Arunav Goswami did one hour show that Cambridge Analytica claimed that they have helped government uh, Bihar win election in 2009. Now, Mr. Modi's Facebook was launched by me in 2011. Imagine how many people were there on Facebook platform in India in 2009. People did not even know Facebook as a platform for the political purpose. I'm talking about India, forget about Bihar. <laughs> if there was not even 1% of people of Bihar on Facebook, and Cambridge Analytica is claiming that they have impacted the election outcome of 2009 and Arunav Goswami is getting agitated that this is the breach against the national security. 
and we all get sucked into it. Look what they are doing. Baba, ask a basic question. How many Facebook users were there in Bihar in 2009? Cambridge Analytica will come there. So this is a very simple question. Any politician who has been able to successfully marry governance, politics and development? Any? Any politician in your view who has been successful? Lot of them. Lot of them. I do not have a, a wisdom to kind of rank anyone. But I encourage you to read uh, uh, Ramchandra Guha has written the 10 best, best chief ministers uh, India has seen post-independence. Uh, two of them figure from Tamil Nadu. Two of them out of those 10 are from Tamil Nadu. And if you read those names, you would realize that why those, like Sankarar Chauhan in Maharashtra, Anadurai in uh, 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 Tamil Nadu, uh, Pratap Singh Kero in Punjab, you would see the impact that how the position of the state has fundamentally changed. And one good thing to track is to see the state's ranking on per capita basis or the size of economy or the key developmental indicators at the time of independence and see the journey of the states over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years. You, and then if you plot these 10 chief ministers, which he ranks as top 10, it could be 10, it could be 12. So don't get into whether Ramchandra Guha has some bias or not. Maybe that list would be 12, maybe 15. But you could put those 15, 10 years and see the state moving up and down, straight. It's a quantifiable thing. Tamil Nadu moving from being in outside 10 states, being in 10th to 30th state, in top five, you will see it would have started taking shape during Anadurai's time. Same for Punjab, same for Maharashtra. Any state that has seen a massive change in their relative ranking would have had some leader who would have, been played, the who would have played a role of a catalyst. It's something which you can do in your room. You can go and exercise this. Conduct this exercise, you will figure it out. So you don't need a Prashant Kishor or anyone to say because I would have a personal bias who is a good leader, who is a bad leader. All of us we have. But these numbers do not lie. Plot the state's development over 70 years, the relative ranking, and see states which has moved five positions or six positions, not on one indicator, on set of five, six, ten indicators. And those indicators should also be your personal choice. Because for some of you, maybe economic equality or communal harmony is more important than pure economic growth. But what you will realize that these real game changers would have delivered almost across all indicators. Almost across all indicators. So that was a very diplomatic answer. He is not talking about the current uh, Prime Minister or Chief Ministers. That so is if you will ask, I will answer that also. You said which leader I, uh, literally I am naming that uh, uh, Ramchandra Guha has named uh, 10. You can add your own, you can have your own list. It's like naming the best 11, the cricket. We all are cricket crazy people. So every person who names the top 11, find four or five common ones and then some changes here and there. You can do it yourself. Okay, so I've given you the criteria how possibly you could do. And I will actually open it up for students who can start. Yeah. Thank questions. you, sir, for your views and insights. We would now be taking questions from the audience. We request you to kindly raise your hand if you have a question and the mic will be passed on to you. Good evening, sir. Uh, my question to help me understand with your name and what you do. Uh, uh, I'm Pranav. Uh, I'm in second year metallurgy and materials during my B.Tech. Uh, my question to you. Which state, sir? Uh, I'm from Maharashtra, from Pune specifically. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, fundamentally, what is the uh, election uh, campaigning and overall uh, difference between India and U.S.? India and U.S. Like the kind of campaigns that they run there and the people uh, reacting to those campaigns. Hugely different. It should be different, it is different, and it should be different. You're talking about a continent. India is a continent. So if I were to com ever compare US elections, I would compare it with a state. 
Com comparing India's election with US is demeaning to India. You are talking about 800 million voters. 800 million voters versus in US would be what? 120, 150. It's not even one sixth. So I wouldn't compare, plus the per capita income basis. We are like 2000 per capita basis. We are $2,000 per, per person. They are around 54, 55,000. So their aspirations, their challenges, their uh, needs are vastly different than what would be ours. So of course, campaign has to factor that in. So what you see, a lot of freebies and all in India because its survival is at stake. It's very easy for you and I to say that why a state has to give this much freebies. Imagine someone who is to make sure that the, there is bread in, on the plate of his child every evening. He gives a damn to what is happening to the environment. Even if he wants, he cannot think about right-based approach. Even if he wants, he cannot be concerned about what is happening to the space program. He comes back home, he has to make sure that there is a bread on the table. If he doesn't work through the day, his children are going to go empty stomach. It's very easy for you and I to say that why these politicians always keep talking about these things. You have no idea. 800 million people. 80 crore people still do not make 100 rupees a day. In India, 80 crore people do not make 100 rupees a day. And you and I expect them to think about future, think about environment, think about right-based approach. Baba, if someone gives him 5,000 rupees, one month food is secured. So he's well within his right to take money and then vote. There's no wrong in that. Make no mistake. It's one thing for you and I to preach. And if I and you have to be in that position, we will do the same thing what they are doing. So I would never compare these two. And it should not be compared. Anyone, you don't need to ask me. Yeah, Just uh, get up and ask. Hi, sir. Uh, I'm Akash. I'm a third year student. Uh, you have already asked three questions to me when you met me individually. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. So you mentioned that uh, 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 the local elections will be uh, run on party ticket in Bihar. What are the other changes that we can expect to see uh, when it comes to municipal governance in Bihar, municipal or uh, uh, Panchayati Raj? As a country, it took us 50 years before Parliament made that amendment in 90s, empowering Panchayati Raj. See, you and I make the big mistake. For us, all MLAs and MPs are the governments. Have you ever seen a senator in US being bothered about a drainage or the road or the school? They are there. Their primary job is to legislate. In India, they are not doing le legislation. They are just interested in transfer, posting, nali, gali, sadak. The local bodies, the work which should be done by the local bodies is actually being done by the MPs and M MLAs or people expect them to. And that's why you and I get angry that MP banne ke baad bhi dekho kuch sadak nahi badni. Sadak uske haath mein hai nahi. Have you ever tried to visualize that why someone like Rahul Gandhi or Modi, he's the Prime Minister, why Banaras roads are not changing? Even if the he is the Prime Minister. Why he is not? Suppose your MP is incompetent. But why roads of Banaras are not changing? Baba, wo municipal corporation ko karna hai. Modi cannot do anything beyond pushing it, beyond probably putting an officer of his choice as the head of the corporation. Government of India cannot build the sub lanes of Varanasi. But you and I, the way it is in India, Log MP ko gali dete hai, people criticize MPs and MLAs because roads bana nahi, pani nahi nikal raha hai, bijli nahi aa raha hai. Bijli, can any MP make a power station? If power distribution is flawed, what MP or MLA can do? They can do nothing. So local bodies, I see as India, democracy matures in India, you will see 20 year, 30 year down the line, 
I see they become more powerful, they handle more resources, and the Constitution says 50% of the development bu budget should be spent through them. So if they are spending 50%, look at some people from Maharashtra, your Jila Parishad probably handles more money than any MP or minister can handle in other states. And that is how it should be. Because the Jila Parishad knows what is the requirement on the ground. How uh, on the earth a secretary who has come from Karnataka sitting in Delhi can decide about the rural requirement in Maharashtra or Tamil Nadu. That's how it is today. A joint secretary in a department in Government of India decides for whole of India what is your requirement. In the name of uniformity, in, in the name of very good planning and in the name of a stopping corruption. It's all flawed. The more decentralization takes place, there will be some problem in terms of design and uniformity. There might be some corruption also on the ground, but in the long run, that will deliver. You cannot let people sitting in Delhi, few bureaucrats who do not even know for whom they are deciding. They are taking, they, 16 lakh crore is the government of India's budget. Bulk of it, which goes on development, is decided by what? 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 bureaucrats. They put the design, they put earmark the money and everyone else has to follow that. How much understanding, I understand even if I give that those 15 people are the wisest persons on the planet. How much understanding they would have of the 2 lakh panchayats in India. They would have no understanding or very little understanding. But every panchayat head, every Jila Parishad head has to follow what these 15 wise people have decided sitting in Delhi, that this is how your government and this is how you should, what is the requirement of your panchayat, this is the money we are sending, spend it this way and send me the report. Good evening, sir. Here up. Uh, my name is Carol. Yes. Uh, considering you worked for the Modi government and you know... I, you I worked with Mr. Modi, not with Mr. Go Modi government. Yes, okay. Considering you worked with Mr. Modi and with the Indian Science Congress behind this, I want to ask you a hypothetical question. If you were a political strategist working for a party and you know, let's say leaders of a party made a verifiably incorrect statement in public, what would your advice to them be? See, it's not a hypothetical situation. I would have been part of many of his speeches where where he would have made a statement which were not 100% verifiable. But if you are a realist, when you are handling one, two million communication, there has to be a balance between what is factually correct and how it should be communicated. So, I give you an example. In Bihar, in last 15 years, Nitish Kumar government has made 1 lakh 20, 1.2 lakh kilometers road. One way to communicate is you say that we have built 1.2 lakh kilometer of road. Another way to say it that as a chief minister, I, am pro I have promised and I have delivered that Bihar ke kisi kone se patna ane mein aapko paanch ghante lagenge. Now the second statement is factually could be incorrect. Because from some places it might take five and a half hours, six hours, because no one has verified it. But that's the language which is based on some work. It is not lie, but a language which people understand and it creates impact in a rally or when you are communicating with millions of people. If you start giving detail of kilometer and miles and, you know, people don't understand it. And that's why you would have seen in 2014, I don't like to take names, but say Mr. Chitambaram making a lot of factual statement. Gujarat rank is this much on education, on health rank is this much. And Modi is saying that Gujarat model of development is something which I want to replicate across India. People bought that idea. So yes, you should not lie, but a little bit of tweaking or to make it more acceptable or understandable for the masses is something which should be allowed. The another factor is also the communicator, how comfortable he is. I worked with Congress also. And if I were to tell Mr. Manmohan Singh that, Sir, ye baat kahi hai, he will read whole light, again come in the morning, and again he will ask me, lekin ye to fact, Prasanji, theek nahi hai. 
and there are leaders who are comfortable with it. If you are a Lalu Yadav, and I tell him, sir, bol dijiye ki kal sab ki jindagi thik ho jayegi, to bol denge. If, if you are a Modi, then I have to back it with some data. And if you are a Manmohan Singh, then I have to back it completely with data. So, but if you are a campaigner, you have to strike a balance somewhere which is closer to the fact, but understandable to the masses. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Sriram. I am doing my B.Tech in Chemical Engineering here. Uh, we have seen a trend in the recent times that each uh, during each state uh, government elections, political parties promised to write off farm loans. It happened in Maharashtra, it happened in Uttar Pradesh. But this is going to put huge uh, pressure on the banks which have given these loans. So, uh, and each time lakhs of crores of farm loans are written off. So what do you think is going to be the permanent solution for uh, upliftment of farmers or for their woes, how to solve their woes? So, I'm not an ag agriculture expert, so definitely I do not have a, I do not have a vision or a plan to share how the farm or agrarian crisis could be sorted in India on a sustainable basis. But a couple of facts. The Swaminathan Commission report, which is the base for all the discussion in India on agriculture, has pronounced that all agriculture activity, all house, any household which is cultivating land which is two, less than two acres, farming is not sustainable. So no matter what you how much effort you put, no matter what you sow, no matter what you harvest, on medium to long term basis, farming of less than two acres is not economically viable or sustainable. But we as a country has pu have put 50% people to remain engaged in the farm farming activities. So we owe it to them. And you should not be bothered about farm loan waiver. It doesn't put a stress on the banking as you are just you said. First of all, banks do not waive the loan. Loan is waived from the government. Banks are just the intermediaries. Banks have got 12 lakh crores of NPA. None of that is coming from farm. It's all coming from the industrialists. Are you bothered about that? When telecommunication started in India, government moved from the fee base to revenue share, what was the fundamental basis? That it is not economically viable for companies to pay the fee and grow. So if, some, if there is a person or a group of person who are not able to do something the way it should be done, then I can understand your logic. But 50% of India population cannot be inefficient, cannot be corrupt, cannot be thieves. If they are not able to make sense of agriculture, then we as a country have to help them. There is no harm in it. At the beginning of 20th century, close to 50%, where we are today, similar data you can have in US. Close to 50% people were engaged in agriculture. 100 years down the line, today only 2% people in US are directly engaged in agriculture, and productivity in agriculture has gone up by almost 105 times. So the way forward is less people on agriculture, and that will make it more viable, and then probably lesser need for you and I or the government to wave off the loan. Wave off of the loan is not because of the bank, not because they are inefficient, and you cannot let them die for the want of 50,000 crores or 60,000 crores. It's not big enough money for which you can let people die. Government has spent a lot of money on these 50,000, 60,000 crores, they spend a lot of bullshit. And you and I don't care. The moment it is going to a specific farmer sector, we get agitated. That's not the right thing to do. If one industrialist fails, I'm not a center you know, leftist guy, but if one industrialist fails, 50,000 crores or 60,000 crore is a write off. That 50,000 crore can take care of the entire farmer farming community of whole of Maharashtra. What do you want to do? If you are sitting on the chair and you know that half of my population is in crisis, should you give that 50,000 crore or you shouldn't? 
And banks are in mess because of their own corruption and own ineff inefficiency, not because of waiving of the farm loan. They have not given a penny from the banks. And they are still bleeding and they are all in deep red. Money has come from the exchequer, from your money, my money, the taxpayers' money. Banks have not given the money. They, are, they make a lot of halla gulla about it. You ask a banker, how much money you have given? How much money SBI would have given? How much money any bank would have given? They are just the facilitator. Money is coming from the budget. My name is Manjeet. Uh, I'm from Devgar, Jharkhand, and I'm doing a PhD here in mechanical engineering. Uh, I would ask you a question considering you as a uh, vice president of uh, Jadiu. So my question is how much you are, uh, how much you are prepared for coming Lok Sabha elections, uh, especially seeing the politics of Bihar where more of uh, caste-based politics uh, persist and Bahubali-based uh, politics persist and especially about uh, Munger Lok Sabha seat where uh, <laughs> uh, and especially and where uh, recently uh, one more move uh, have been observed that uh, uh, famous IPS Manu Maharaj have been uh, uh, got promoted as a DIG and posted in Munger itself. Okay, I will not get into the specific, the, the larger issue of the uh, importance of caste because I would, I don't think a lot of people are here to understand the dynamics of Munger Lok Sabha which we, you and I can discuss separately. See, this is two things which I should say on my own because sooner or later someone will ask. The importance of caste and the money. How much it is detrimental to the, anyone becoming a politician and being successful in the, politics, in the politics. We say that everything in India moves on in the name of caste, especially in Hindi heartland. First of all, barring few states here and there, caste is universal in India. It is not less or more in UP or Bihar. Take it from me first hand. I have done it in Gujarat. It is as much as it is in Simandra. It is the same in Bihar, same in UP. In some states where sub-regionalism is a concept, like a Tamil, a Assamese, Bengalis, there you have Indian, then you are a Tamilian, then the caste becomes the third layer. In Bihar or UP or Madhya Pradesh, there is no sub-regionalism concept. So you are an Indian and then you go to the caste. That's why optically it looks more caste dominated, but in reality, caste is as important in Bihar as it is in Tamil Nadu or Andhra or Gujarat. The second thing, how much it plays in politics. It's a reality of the society. So if you ever want to become a politician or an advisor of a politician, you need to have a very deep and solid understanding of the caste. I, I want you to underline the word, understanding of the caste. Understanding caste is not equivalent to practicing caste-based politics. So very successful politicians, they, they have a very deep understanding of caste's dynamics. But does, that does not mean that they all practice caste-based politics. So Nitish Kumar would have, or Modi would have, very good understanding of caste, as much as a Mayawati or Mulayam Singh or Lalu Yadav. But they do not overtly play the caste politics. How much is the impact of the caste? You are from Jharkhand. In Jharkhand in 2014, because no amount of argument will convince you, so I am giving you the example. And anyone from the, any state can stand up and I will take that. Because he has raised the question, he is from Jharkhand. In Jharkhand 2014, who got the vote in Lok Sabha? Mr. Modi, right? But yeah, vote kisko pada? Modi ko? Pada nahi pada? In Maharashtra, vote kisko pada? Modi ko pada? In Bihar, vote Modi ko pada? Modi ji ke jati ke kitne log us state mein rehte hain? Rehte hain? Nahi. Aap mein se sare log kahenge, some of you will tell, that no, no, it was the big hype created, Modi, Lahir, social media, that is why caste was not that important. I agree with you. Okay. For an argument's sake, I agree. Now let's go back to 1989. There was another Prime Minister, Mr. Biswanath Pratap Singh. He walked out of Congress with three people, no organization, no party, 
in one year and a half he demolished Congress electorally, which was far bigger electoral machine than what BJP is today. He belonged to a caste called Rajput. What is the proportion of Rajputs in Hindi heartland? Not more than 5% in any state. The same caste societies voted for Mr. Viswanath Pratap Singh. You will say that no, 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 it was because of the Bufors, it was because of Rahul, Rajiv Gandhi was very unpopular, this, that. Okay, go further back, 1984. Everywhere Congress won. The same caste society voted for anyone who was Congress candidate. You plot these three things, the facts, as it stands. What does it tell you? That if there is a person, a narrative, a, a narrative or an event that superimposes itself on everything else, then caste becomes the identity, becomes the second. The political pundits, the journalists, the analysts write that this wave election tha. That was the Indra ji ke death ka wave tha. Ye Modi ki lahar thi. That's what you read. In reality, and I can take you to the up to 1952, you would see that wherever a person or a narrative or a discourse has become so prominent and appealing to the masses. The caste has played the secondary role. That tells me as a campaigner that it is possible to overcome the caste hurdle. And it is not my prospective wisdom. That's, that is what the data is telling us. Because if you take the state elections, you will see anyone who has in, evolved on the scene with a big narrative, big uh, program, or something that would have caught the imagination of people, People have voted for them. So never ever get this feeling that only everything is driven by caste. Everything is driven by caste as much as it is driven in US about the, with the color skin, uh, skin of the color or the tribes in Africa. Social aggregation or in some form or other is the reality of human, humanity. If it is called caste in India, it is called tribes in Africa, and it might be called something else in other part of the world. There are 10,000 tribes in Africa, 54 countries, 1.2 billion population, which is similar to what we have in India. Probably we would have 5,000 or 6,000 caste in India. So you and I need not be defensive about it. It's a reality. Whether it's right or wrong, it's a different debate. As a politician, you do not have option to make everything ideal. Everything becomes ideal, then I will start doing politics is not an option. Politics is as good or as bad as the society is. If there is caste in society, politician has to understand caste. If there is criminality in society, then you have to understand the criminality and the pattern of it. If you want to work against caste, then you will become a social reformer, which your choice, you can do it. But as a politician, never, never ever get this feeling that I will be a politician if everything is ideal. There is no corruption, there is no caste, there is no criminal, there is no challenge, then I will become a politician. It will be like saying, Cristiano Ronaldo says that give me the ball, no one should check me and I will make a goal. Who cares? If you want to become the leader of any society, you have to accept the pluses and the minus, the positives and negatives of the society as it exists, win it, and then you can choose to make amends, make corrections, make your effort. But if you think that society becomes ideal and then you will do the favor by joining or choosing to be the leader of that society, this is the most flawed argument young people have. Sir, I am Mashuda Sultana, PhD in Civil Engineering. I am from Tamil Nadu. I am impressed with your idea of bringing in one lakh youth in politics. So my question is, uh, what is your strategy on making that in reality? Like how you are going to bring the discipline or the awareness or the uh, political knowledge in such a large number of youth? 
because currently in my state right now, because there's a large number of youth who are interested in getting into politics and bringing in changes, but that kind of discipline or the collective awareness is uh, not, not unable to establish right now. So what is your strategy on bringing that into reality? Thank you. It's rather simple uh, because whatever little I have done in the past, when I went to Bihar, I said, okay, I have been advising Modi's and Nitish Kumar's and all the names which Professor has kindly read. Now I want to advise young people who otherwise has got nobody to look uh, to who can advise or help him or her. And I will spend next two years meeting the people, helping them become Mukhya, become Jila Parishad member, become uh, uh, MLA or um, try to become MP. And I have circulated something on Facebook page. This is the message, that if you want to join politics and be guided by Prashant Kishore, here is the number, my office number. And in last two months, 50 days is what we have ran the campaign in Bihar, which is not the most connected uh, online um, crowd. I've got 50,000 people, and I've stopped registration because I'm not able to meet them as much as I should and I could. So in next two years, the idea is not only to make people join. I need to be having this session which I'm having with you. I do this session from morning to evening for people who are registered in what we call Youth in Politics, YIP. And after the group, I, the opportunity with the, is with the guy to meet me individually. That takes a lot of time. And that's what I do whole day. From 9 o'clock to 11, if I'm in Patna, this is what I do sitting at Chief, Chief Minister's residence, uh, this is what I do. So anyone who wants to, I'm sure the leaders who are here, the, if Rajinikanth wants to do this or Mr. Kamal Hassan wants to do it, they can do it as well. Because in my experience in the last five, six years, I have seen there is enough number out there who want to join politics. There is nobody to guide them. And there is nobody to assure them that if you make an effort, if you are there for five years, six years, ten years, there is a political party which is going to give you tickets. Because Rahul Gandhi has also tried this in 2007-8. And a party which fights elections in, on pan-India basis, he definitely has a larger canvas to operate. He has not able to give 50 such people tickets to become MLA. I am promising in Bihar, we are a very small party, that I will make sure that the, and I'm making this public announcement every second day, that comes in local papers, media, whatever, that in next five years, the average age of JDU MLA should become 45. That means I have to make people who are less than 45 fight elections, because there are people who are 55, 60, I cannot throw them off. And I have also announced that almost 50 MLAs that's the target in 2020, 50 MLS should be below, 50, below 40. That, that's the only way we can bring the average, average age around 45. So this is the strategy. A strategy is whatever little name is there, people are excited that, okay, people have heard about it, that Prashant Kishor can advise someone. So if you want to become a Mukhiya and you get a chance that you can meet me and be guided by me, you come if you choose to. And that there, I do not see the problem in numbers. The problem is I'm not able to do it as much as I should and I could. And second is, I have a political, political platform in Bihar, so I cannot make that commitment in Tamil Nadu because I don't have a political platform. Now, one of you or some of you could ask this question because I hear this in Delhi and other places, that why are you not doing it at a pan-India basis? It's because I do not want to over-promise and under-deliver. If I want, if I am able to do this in Bihar, Next time when I come to IIT Madras and I tell you that do this, I would have something where I would have proven and I would have delivered in Bihar, then you will take me more seriously. Thank you, sir, for your insightful talk. I think uh, due to paucity of time, we'd have to stop. I uh, See, I, in 15, 20 minutes, I have to leave because I have a meeting at 8.30. You have started late. Uh, I think it's important but that we respect But all sir. of you who want to remain in communication, I have started something new which Indian politicians have not done until now. Twitter pay DM ka. You, you know Twitter the way it is used. I use it for the DM, direct message. 
You can write to me three times, four times a day, and I try to answer as much as I could. Now, you, the natural question that should come to your mind is, why not a phone number, why not WhatsApp, why Twitter? It's because in India we have a psyche. People send message and then call. Sir, message bheja hai par liya ki nahi. We all do that. You go to the platform number, someone says platform number three. Still you and I am in habit, you'll check to the next person. Ye platform number three hai na. Bhai pooch ke aai ho, direction dekh ke aai ho, teen par pahuch gai ho, lekin maano ke nahi. So, learning from that, I have... I, I found a platform which is Twitter, which is reasonably in use. There you cannot make a call. Because if I give you a WhatsApp number, you send me a message and then you will start calling me. If I don't pick the phone, you will say, oh, he's like the same other leaders. He gives the number, he doesn't pick the phone. So the way to remain in touch for all your questions, queries, is you send direct message on Twitter, open your DM as well so that I can reply. Or if you want to meet personally, then I, I conduct these sessions everywhere, like in Mumbai, in Hyderabad, in Delhi, in Patna. My office number is 91216-91216, which is available on the internet. You just call, take time, come and meet. And if you, have, you are enough, then I come to Chennai as well. I go wherever I have a, enough number to justify my day. Yes, whoever wants to ask. I'm here till eight. I think I can stretch it to eight. I have a meeting at 8.30, I have to run. Yes. Can I get the mic, please? Hello, sir. I am Azhar. Uh, I am a PhD student here. And I am from Jammu and Kashmir. So this question is uh, relevant to all. And as a political strategist and analyst, and also been an UN advisor for almost eight years. So recently you have, uh, like you know that Shah Faisal who was a bureaucrat and he has resigned and then he has, he's going to join politics that he has made clear in his interview, in his first interview. And then you saw like, uh, uh, as you said, like it is what matters will make the impact on the uh, politics in the place he belongs to. So in the last week he has mentioned that Kashmiri lives matter. I don't want to go into details on all those things. So my question is, like, you know, like, most of the people, even the governor of the state, he has said that he should not have quit this job and join the politics. He would have contributed more. So as you said that youth should come and join the politics. So what is your stand on it? And what should be the role of youth of other states to get involved? You know, like, what the current situation in Kashmir very well. I hope that. I met the guy. Yeah. He came to meet me also through a friend before he made the decision. See, it's a personal choice, what you want to do. But on a larger point, I want to tell you something. You, for all the flaws in politics, one good thing is, you can start doing or showing your caliber from wherever you are. You don't need to quit your studies. You don't need to quit your job dreams. You achieve that and then you can come in politics. When I'm saying come in politics, Politics is not a train standing on the station which if you do not join tomorrow, it will run away. If Gandhi could study and become what he became, if Nehru can become, if Ambedkar could become, I'm sure you and I can also become, we have enough time. So please, I'm not running a program where I'm asking youth to leave your studies, do not pursue the dream which you and your family has for yourself, for you, and then come and join politics. But you could be more, if you choose to be, then first become the best what you could become. Never underestimate the support or the consent of the family and friend. It is your family which is going to stand with you. Tomorrow, when you are in trouble after joining politics, it is your father who will stand with you, not Prashant Kishore. So, it is in my interest that more people come and follow me. But it may or may not be necessarily in your interest the way I want you to do it. So think for yourself. Don't get swayed away by any individual. It's your life. But do consider. Do consider that this is, if you have it in you, it is possible. My message is only that it is possible. If you choose to be. My idea is not that, oh, everyone should leave and become politician. But my idea is that those who contemplate or have 
uh, thinking that they want to or they could be, be, be politicians, they could be helped. If they have doubts, those doubts could be addressed. There could be some experience that could be brought in, in their, to make their journey more uh, uh, successful. But it is an individual choice. And if you cannot become the leader of your own household, how are you going to be the leader of the society? So if it takes six months for your parents to get convinced, it is worth spending that six months. It is like I was telling a, on a casual note, you have a girlfriend, you want to marry her. The choice is yours. You want to run away with her and get married, parents will fall in line anyway. Or you want to convince that no, she is the best girl and your parents agreeing to it. Which one is more better? Always the second. So never join, a, parents are not your enemies. They are the one, they might have a different perspective. When I came, my father stopped talking to me for six months. But I tell you, on daily basis, unless your parents, your family is with you, the journey will only get tougher and difficult for you. So it's first complete what your parents expect you to do. And you can start politics here. You can start as a student politician. You can start writing. You can start building understanding. You can start uh, sparing some time which you spend on the watching movie. You can do something which is related to politics if that is what you want to pursue. For that, you don't need to quit IIT and join politics. I'm not giving that call, please. Thank you, sir, for your views and insights. I'm sure that the knowledge you have imparted and the ideas you have shared have left a lasting impact on our understanding of Indian politics. As a mark of our gratitude, may I request Professor Preeti Agalyam to felicitate the speaker with the memento. Thank you. May I now request you, sir, to kindly leave us a message in the EML yearbook. We wish to express our heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Prashant Kishore for his presence here with us today. I also thank Professor Sudarshan Patmanabhan, who kindly consented to moderate this session along with us. I take this opportunity to thank all those who have rendered their unfailing support to us in organizing this lecture. Last but not the least, I thank all members of the audience for having come over. Thank you.